Hello, my good students, and welcome. This is Dr. Sami, and we continue revising chemistry. I hope, my students, you're doing well. So, every day it's a learning day, and every minute well spent, it will reward you. So, uh, the KCSE 2022 is almost over. The chemistry, chemistry paper one was done. Chemistry paper two was done. Chemistry paper three was done. And mainly this is my paper here. Though chemistry is just chemistry. Now, why am I highlighting this? I went through the first two papers, the theory papers. And I noted that with chemistry paper one, over 30% of it, it's what we have covered here. Chemistry paper two, over 40%. Maybe in the next one, I'll do analysis of what exactly was covered in these two papers that we have been covering here. So maybe that is not the point for today. What I want us to do is we want to revise organic, yes, organic chemistry we want to revise organic chemistry and for my student this is a comprehensive revision of organic chemistry so you must have covered organic chemistry one and organic chemistry two so if you have not covered organic chemistry two kindly first of all go through organic chemistry two before we go through this uh revision my student uh, ladies and gentlemen welcome we want to go through organic chem chemistry and uh, just like I've said, you must have covered organic chemistry one and organic chemistry uh, two. This one, it's a good revision for a form for a student. Now, what exactly are we going to go th through in this section? Uh, basically, I will do an overview, an overview of the many processes that we cover in organic uh, chemistry. Um, uh, for example, the, the categories of the sections that we cover in chemistry is organic chemistry 1 in form 3 and uh, organic chemistry 2 in form 4. Uh, mainly I will combine the two, I will do an overview, an overhaul of these two uh, topics because they are just but the same thing. Now, Let's start with organic chemistry one. What is organic chemistry one or what does it entail? This one covers the hydrocarbons. And if somebody asks you, what is a hydrocarbon? A hydrocarbon is a compound that contains carbon and hydrogen only. Or rather, it is made up of carbon and hydrogen only. Now, we want to look at some of the compounds that we cover in organic chemistry one and they are covered under what we call homologous series. This is a group of uh, organic compounds that have some shared characteristics, be it the formula, be it the properties, chemically or physically. They have some similarity. Like we cover the compounds we call alkanes, alkanes. And you can see uh, the structure of an alkane. It has carbon, carbon, single bonds throughout the structure. So that is what identifies the alkenes. Then we have the alkenes. Yes, the alkenes. They have at least one carbon-carbon double bond in the structure. And that is what identifies the alkenes. Then we have what we call the alkynes. Remember, these are all hydrocarbons. The alkynes. The alkynes, at least there is a carbon-carbon triple bond somewhere, like you can see here. This one, we are calling them the functional groups, except for alkanes, because I've even uh, highlighted here, because this is not necessarily a functional group. But the alkenes, the carbon-carbon double bond, the alkynes, the carbon-carbon triple bond, yes, they are called a functional group. Maybe you're asking yourself, what is a functional group, my student? A functional group is the active point of that organic compound. 
actually it is the point or the group that will determine the chemical properties of that uh, compound because it is active at that specific Moving on my student organic chemistry 2 again we look at the homologous series that we of the compounds we cover in organic chemistry 2 and of course their functional uh, groups we start with the first one alkanos otherwise called alcohols you can see uh, you can see the functional group the OH the OH is the functional uh, group then we have what we call alkanoic acids and that is called the carboxylic acid the functional group as you can see it is a carbon attached to oxygen a double bond there and OH that is the COOH carbon and two oxygen and H there as it is the, the drawing of that structure is very important there very important then we have another group of compounds we call esters esters as you can see a carbon of course an oxygen there with a double bond oxygen and an R remember in this case the R all through represent what we call the alkyl group they represent what we call the alkyl group and uh, shortly we are going to see what that is the alkyl group in this case can all be different as you have seen here I've used uh, different colors it can they can all be different so that is esters and of course I've said the R represent the alkyl group so my student just look at the structure of the three uh, homologous series here the alkanos look at them how they are at least there is an OH somewhere then the alkanoic acid at least there is a COOH yes somewhere the uh, carboxylic group there then esters at least there is such a structure in the, the compound that you are working with and uh, maybe maybe look at uh, these alkyl groups because uh, we'll be working with them once and again uh, like we have the structure like the first one look at that this is a methane that has one hydrogen removed if this is a methane with a terminal hydrogen removed this is a methyl so it is a part of the groups that we're calling the alkyl okay if you look at that one this one it is more of the structure of ethane yes with one hydrogen here removed so if I do that, the part that remains, whatever remains here is called ethyl. It is an ethyl. Moving on, if I look at this one, this is a propane with a single terminal hydrogen here removed. If that happens, this is a propyl, etc., etc. Yes, the, the pattern continues just like that. If this is methane, this is methyl. If this is ethane, this is ethyl. Then propane gives us uh, propyl. Butane will give us butyl. Pentane will give us pentyl, etc., etc. The, those are just called alkyls. They are mostly substitutes or groups that are attached to a long ch uh, carbon chain, etc., etc. Now, other organic compounds that maybe we will not look at them in detail mm -hmm. include the detergents yes then like the soapy detergents and soapless detergents the polymers that are formed either by addition polymerization or condensation or polymerization we have fibers be it the synthetic fiber or the natural uh, fibers maybe those are just but some organic compounds that maybe we'll not look at them in detail however we've said we are just concentrating with the processes the very many processes we cover good now how are we going to cover this organic chemistry i'm going to have a very comprehensive flowchart because mainly when you'll be examined in organic chemistry uh, they will use a flowchart now look at that flowchart to my student i i know i know it looks scary yes it looks a bit scary very dense a network of processes there and what does that tell you the organic compounds we are talking about they can be interlinked we can link them 
look at this flowchart. We have almost 20 something, 23 or 24 processes here. We are starting from here. Starch or glucose converted to crude ethanol, a process A. Process B, crude ethanol being converted to pure ethanol here, process B. Ethanol converted to ethene, yes, double bond there. Process C, process D, ethene going back to ethanol. Okay, ethene going to uh, eth uh, ethane with A, you can see a single bond, that is process E. Process F, you have ethane going to ethene, that is process F. Process G, you can have ethane going to ethane, okay, that is G. A process H, where you have eth ethane, yes, with A there, going to another compound there with the chlorine and another chlorine atom, process H. Process I, uh, ethane with A going to CO2 and water, you can see. Process J, you have ethane going again to CO2 and water. Process K, you have ethane going to carbon, CO or CO2 and water. Yes, you can see that. You have another process here, process L. Yes, ethane going to another compound there with uh, uh, bromine. Yes, bromine atoms, two of them, two of them you can see there. You have process M, that is process L, process M where you have a thin with a double bond going all the way to another compound there. CL, CL, you can see, uh, yeah, we have process N, a thin again, undergoing a process N to form that key polymer, something, something there, a very big polymer there. Then you have process P, where you have a thin undergoing a reaction again to give you a compound with a BR there, that is a bro, BR, uh, that is a bromine there. We're going to see what that is. Process Q, ethanol becoming this compound. You can see there with the potassium and hydrogen gas there. Then we have ethanol again undergoing a process R to form the compound you see there. Uh, process S, ethanol undergoing another process to form this one. Yes, over there. Process T, the first compound we formed from ethanol here. That is ethanoic acid undergoing a reaction to form this. Good, you have process U, as you can see over there. Uh, process V, the compounds and the, the, react, the products, there they are. Process W, starting from long chain alkane, going to uh, ethane there. Okay, uh, sodium propanoid again, undergoing process X to form uh, ethane. Crude oil giving us a thing. All the way, process A to Y, you can see, uh, except process zero, uh, process O there, it's not there. So that means there are 24 processes, among others by student. So can we use this flowchart to study organic chemistry? And basically I said we are studying, uh, we are studying what we call processes, processes. So let's start with process, process A, starch or glucose being converted to crude ethanol. My student, can you guess what that is? Good, that is fermentation. The natural decomposition of organic substances by some microorganism to form ethanol, CO2 and some heat, uh, heat is generated. Maybe what are the conditions necessary for this process? We need a catalyst, the yeast will act as a natural catalyst that will convert the starch or glucose to crude ethanol. And of course, this process needs time, maybe 48 hours thereabout, and a temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius. So that is the process A and the conditions. Okay, the chemical processes, glucose, you can see the formula, it is acted upon. You know, remember yeast provide what we call the, the enzymes. The enzymes, I don't know, amylase or something that will convert ethanol, uh, glucose to ethanol, as you can see. But this ethanol is very crude, 10% pure, so it is more of water. Uh, remember CO2 and uh, water and heat are also pro produced there. To confirm that uh, CO2 is produced, remember the ordinary process of confirmatory that, for that. That one we use uh, lime water and uh, white precipitate will be formed. So we are done with the process A. It is fermentation. 
the conditions you can see, the reaction you can see. Uh, process B, whereby now we convert crude ethanol to pure ethanol. That process is fractional distillation. Uh, the condition, we need to heat, so we need heat. And uh, the process itself, you have now the, uh, the crude ethanol, the 10% or the 5%. It is acted upon or rather you use fractional distillation and you obtain a more pure uh, ethanol, 95% pure. If you want to remove the 5% water, you can use calcium oxide. It has a very good ability to absorb the, the, the extra water and you will get absolute ethanol, absolute ethanol, almost 99% ethanol. And... Um, and remember for that process for that process there you can uh, do some distillation using some other drying agents like or that can absorb uh, water vapor aluminium oxide etc etc we go to process c ethanol being converted to ethene with a double bond there that process is dehydration the process for the removal of elements that makes water so i need to remove one h here then i'll have two h then i remove the oh so the one h and the oh goes away and makes water that is absorbed by the dry, uh, the dehydrating agent that i'm working with uh, then of course a double bond will be formed here then i'll have h2 carbon double bond uh, carbon h2 Condition necessary for this, the most appropriate drying agent or dehydrating agent is concentrated sulfuric acid. That is it. That is the reagent that we use there. Remember, we can use aluminum oxide that will serve as a dehydrating agent and a catalyst for that matter. The temperature should be between 180, uh, 160 to 180, thereabout, the temperature for uh, dehydration. The process or the chemical reaction there, you can see ethanol acted upon by concentrated sulfuric acid at a temperature of 160 to 180. A thin gas is produced and water. So that is process C, my student, dehydration. Ethanol to a thin, an alkanol to uh, an alkyl. Good. We move on. In case we do incomplete dehydration, remember this can undergo incomplete dehydration. Uh, whereas here the temperature should be 140, then a thin will be not will not be produced. But instead there will be production of another chemical we call ether. And as you can see, the chemical uh, reaction process D. A thin, yes, with a double bond, is being converted back to ethanol. So we want to see what exactly is the process. The name of the process, hydrolysis, the opposite of hydration or dehydration, the opposite of dehydration. Uh, condition necessary for that again, concentrated sulfuric six acid, water and some warming. So this step the, the, or this process will take several steps. Like you can see that is step number one. Ethene is acted upon or rather it reacts with uh, sulfuric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid at room temperature, my student, to form what we call ethyl hydrogen sulfate. This is a, a special ester there, a very unstable compound that if you add water, like you can see the second reaction there, or rather the second step, ethyl hydrogen sulfate, okay, reacts with water, it is hydrolyzed, and now we need to do some warming. The condition here is warming. Remember, there's this warm. And that is the time uh, ethanol will be produced and sulfuric acid is regenerated. So my student, process D from ethene to ethanol, that is hydrolysis, hydrolysis, process D. Uh, moving on to process E, we have ethene with a double bond being converted to uh, a then with the single carbon carbon bond there. The process is called hydrogenation. It is an example of addition reaction, hydrogenation. And uh, 
condition necessary for that, we need a catalyst. We need what we call the nickel catalyst. We can use palladium, we can use platinum, any. But nickel catalyst is the very common. We need also temperature of between 150 to 250. So ordinarily we say a temperature of 180, it will be convenient if you can maintain to that. Chemical reaction for that, a thin, as you can see, undergoes an addition reaction. Yes, remember it is uh, a hyd the hydrogen molecule will break down and the double bond will open. Yes, my student, the very active point of the alkene, the double bond. The double bond opens and creates space for hydrogen on both sides, as you can see. So my student, for instance, this question, it, it appears in a question paper. Look at it. Over here, there are two hydrogens. Over here, there are three. Over here, there are two. Again, here, there are three. So automatically, you can tell the reagent. It is hydrogen gas that has been added. So by analyzing the flowchart, studying it very keenly, you can be able to tell the reagents that are being used for a certain uh, step. So basically, what have I said? This is hydrogenation. The catalyst required is there. The prevailing temperature should be there. And of course, uh, the reaction is there. Addition reaction. A reaction that leads to formation of one molecule. Yes, two molecules come together and forms one. Process F. You can see we are coming from ethane to ethene. As uh, we have done with the other process E, you can see there was a two, one hydrogen here, one hydrogen. And now as you can see, there are two, two. Meaning there is a hydrogen gas that has been added. Again, this is an addition reaction. Hydrogenation. Hydrogenation. Then as we have said with the process E, the conditions are the same. Now for this one, you can see we are coming from, yeah, this should be ethyne. Yes, it is H, uh, C, and then CH there. Yes, and of course we are ending up with ethene. So that one, my student, you can correct uh, there. Well, that is a simple hydrogenation, just like the other one. And uh, we end up with ethene. Okay, my student, we move on. Uh, process G. Again, we are coming from ethane. Yes, and we end with ethane. Okay, triple bond ending with a single bond. Meaning, again, this is a hydrogenation. Only that we are using uh, two moles. As you can see, uh, we are working with the two moles of hydrogen gas. Like you can see here, it is two moles of hydrogen gas. That is the reagent there. So the process is hydrogenation. Yes, we are using two moles. Actually, you can see process G, it is the sum of F and E. Because this is one mole of hydrogen from uh, ethane to ethene. Then one mole of hydrogen gas again uh, from ethene to ethene. Yes, so this is all about hydrogenation. The processes, the conditions as I'm giving there. Okay, my student, we move on. Uh, maybe where do we apply hydrogenation? Hydrogenation is used in hardening of oil. For instance, uh, the manufacture of umajali from oil. So hardening of oil. What does, does that tell you? Oil is basically unsaturated hydrocarbons. They have the double bonds somewhere. And when you react them with the hydrogen, you get fats. So fats are generally alkanes. They have carbon-carbon single bond throughout the structure. So that is simply an application of uh, hydrogenation. We go to process H. Yes, my student, you can see ethane becoming H2, C, L2, they are a single bond, there, there, blah, 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 that one. The compound you can see there. That process is called substitution. Why is this happening? The H here, and of course we need to know what are exactly, what are the, re, the reagent. You can see this one was without chlorine. Now, the new compound has two chlorine. So, the chlorine uh, is the reagent there. Yes, the reagent, chlorine. Then, uh, the condition necessary for this one is the presence of 
ultraviolet rays or what you call the UV rays and of course some heating. Now, what exactly has happened? Chlorine has substituted hydrogen. That is a substitution reaction. It can, it can take place in steps. You know, one chlorine can just substitute one hydrogen. Then the next step, and of course you'll get, like in this case, if one chlorine is substituted there, you'll get uh, chloroethane. And of course, remember now the other chlorine will go, co go combining with the hydrogen and it will form hydrogen chloride. Then again, another chlorine or hydrogen will be displaced, okay? And then you'll end up with a one, one dichloroethane. My, my student, I've not written down that, but you should know that the substitution can start with one carbon. You have the substitution occurring in one carbon. And remember, this one does not happen when uh, uh, ch chlorine is just pure. You need it mixed with some inert gases like argon. Otherwise, when it is pure, this reaction goes direct to form maybe a carbon. It can go forming even carbon. But th that's not the case because my issue here is we want to know the processes. This is substitution. It occurs in presence of UV rays. What is the use of the UV rays? To break down the chlorine molecule or the halogen molecule. Because this can as well be bromine or something or any other halogen. And uh, once that is formed, the free hydrogen or the, what you call the free chlorine or the free bromine, the free fluorine, they become very active. And in that case, they attack. Yes, they attack the alkanes because alkanes are generally not. The alkanes, the methane, ethane, propane, they do not react. But they can be activated by the, the radical, the chlorine radical that are being formed, and then they react. For example, what is formed here, it's a, a one chloroethene. That is the first step. I've said that step should continue until now, like we have this one. So my student, that is substitution reaction. The reaction of alkanes with halogens. Good, we move on to process I. You can see there, it is an alkane, ethane, uh, undergoing a reaction there to form CO2 in water. My student, that is combustion, a complete combustion. Okay, uh, the heat is required, oxygen, excess oxygen in this case is also required. Chemical reaction, as you can see there, ethane undergoing combustion, complete combustion to form CO2 and water there. Good, the observation, a blue flame is produced when organic compounds undergoes a complete combustion, especially for saturated hydrocarbons. The ones that do not have the double bond or the triple bond, they will burn with a blue flame. Underline that, my student. We move on to process J. We are starting with uh, ethane, and it undergoes again a complete combustion. This is a complete combustion, and it requires a lot of oxygen to form CO2 and water. So that is it, complete combustion of uh, ethane. The equation, as you can see there, it's a complete combustion. This one, I can't say it will form a blue flame. It will generally form uh, react with a yellow flame, but you need a lot of oxygen to convert even the carbon or the CO2 produced to CO2 and water, or rather CO to CO2 and water. Good. We move on to process K. Then after J, we go to K. Again, we have ethane undergoing a reaction to form carbon or carbon 2 oxide, CO2 and water. Anytime you see carbon or carbon 2 oxide, this one is incomplete combustion. You can see that. That is incomplete combustion of uh, alkenes or alkynes for this case. So the condition necessary, heat, and of course you need a limited supply of oxygen there. The chemical reaction, as you can see my student there, that is it, incomplete combustion. The observation, yes, of course it can form the CO, it can form the CO2. So these two indicates incomplete combustion. The observation, yellow flame, incomplete combustion, 
of our organic compounds will burn with a yellow sooty smoky flame um, this applies to most uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons be it alkenes alkynes they will burn with a yellow flame so my student beware of that okay process l you are starting with ethyne reacting with something there you get chbr2 chbr2 there okay what exactly that is that bromination another type of addition reaction a bromination there what exactly is happening two moles of bromine are applied there two moles of bromine are required to form that to open the triple bond all the way to single bond there good uh, chemical reaction that is taking place you can see ethyne reacting the the bromine is yellow in color bromine water actually this should be bromine gas uh, not bromine gas bromine aqueous then you form the colorless it becomes colorless that is another very important qualitative analysis step there that can be used to distinguish between alkenes and alkenes or alkynes for that matter so that is a bromination uh, process uh, maybe that one can take us to what I've just mentioned, the test for saturation, using bromine water. Bromine water is always yellow, though it depends with the concentration of bromine itself. So, unsaturated hydrocarbons, alkenes, alkynes, they will decolorize the yellow bromine water. So, the, the yellow color will go colorless, while the saturated, the alkenes, will not do that. So, that is the first test for saturation i can do combustion and saturated hydrocarbon just like i've said alkenes alkynes they will burn with a yellow flame a yellow sooty uh, flame while the saturated one will burn with a blue flame my student that's a very important point there process m we are starting from alkene yes that is a thin all the way to this compound there as you as you can see alkenes and we go into this so what exactly have we added if i look at it can i can see chlorine yes so the process is addition reaction chlorination it is the same as what we have done here bromination but this is chlorination yes and of course we need one mole of chlorine and of course it will be there remember in this case uh like what i have here it's a one two dichloroethane it's a more stable compound than 1 1 dichloroethane that is something my student you should know that one is more stable the chemical reaction or equation for what is happening you can see this is a 1 2 dichloroethane you can see chlorine gas and the thin there it's an addition reaction chlorination for that matter otherwise you can call it halogenation specifically chlorination ah, we go on process n and you can see clearly here there is a polymer if you see these capital brackets and an n that's a polymer so the process without even much ado it is a polymerization high temperature high pressure sometimes a catalyst it's required that's why we use catalyst like uh the the the, the nata <laughs> the nata that was in a case in one of the cases just the other day and zeorite and uh, aluminium oxide among others quite a number of catalysts can be used for poly Melization. You can see a, a monomer, the, the, the units that are repeating are called monomer. So they repeat themselves to form the polymer. Yes, to form the polymer. And you can see there, the, it is just the double bond. Like this is addition polymerization. The double bond will open, creates room for more monomers to extend on both sides uh, indefinitely. Process P, you have the H2 here h3 so there's a h being added h2 here uh, uh, there's a br there that means there is a h and br so basically we have added a hydrogen bromide so that's an, ad an addition reaction that we call halo halogenation uh, hydro halogenation sorry hydro halogenation uh, that one we have added hydrogen bromide and uh, chemical reaction as you can see there the double bond will open yes the hydrogen and the bromine will attach itself in each carbon and i get a bromoethene over here something we call mcconical 
Uh, yes, that one. The Mark uh, Konikov rule will apply. What does this rule say? If I'm doing an addition reaction, like here yeah, uh, for hydrogen bromide, the hydrogen will go specifically to the carbon atom that has more hydrogen ions. The bromine will go to the uh, carbon that has less hydrogen ions. Uh, for instance, look at that one. The first carbon has two hydrogen. The second carbon here has one. And of course, the third one has three. So the addition can only occur across the double bond. So where does this hydrogen go? The hydrogen will always go to the carbon with more hydrogen atoms, like here. The bromine will go to the second, and that's what exactly has happened to form a two bromopropane. It cannot form a one bromopropane, and that's what we mean by McConkel rule. That one. So note that you know if you had uh, done this and then bromine goes to the first carbon, then you are wrong. So that is McConkel rule. We go to Q. We are starting from ethanol going to a compound here with the potassium and hydrogen. So this is a general reaction of alkano and a metal. And this specifically will apply for the very reactive metals. Potassium, sodium, lithium, magnesium, calcium, there. So, so we move on. Reagents. Like for this one, I needed potassium metal. And the reaction is as I have given there. This is ethanol, yes, ending up with an oxide, an organic oxide, the alk oxide. Like this is potassium ethoxide. If this one was pro propanol, this would be potassium prop oxide. If it was methanol, potassium meth oxide and hydrogen gas there. So my student, that one you should know. We move on. To, okay, generally that is what is happening. Um, an alkano reacting with a metal, the very reactive metal, you get a um, metal alkoxide and hydrogen gas. That is a general reaction there. We go to process R. Ethanol, then we end up with this. This is what we call ester. That is an ester, uh, what we, the compounds we call ester. So from, uh, that is uh, esterification. The process is all esterification. What are the conditions? Drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. We do some warming. And specifically for this one, we're using methanoic acid. So esterification, a reaction between an alkanoic acid and an alkanol. Of course, you can see the chemical reaction. Over here, you need to study the mechanism very well. The alkyl group that is in the ester compound there comes from the alkanol. So the alkyl group is from the alkano okay of course you can see the alkanoid the like with this one you, you can see it is coming from the, the alkanoic acid you can see then the oh from the alkano and the h uh, from the alkanoic acid they combine to form water and when you're naming you name it from the tail that is the part that comes from an alkanol. You say like this is ethyl, because it is ethanol, ethyl. And then this is methanoid, uh, methanoic acid, so it is methanoid. So ethyl methanoid, okay? If you are reacting methanol and ethanoic acid, then it will be methyl ethanoid, okay? Exactly, exactly. My student train yourself how to name esters. So that is esterification process R. Of course, if you are asked one observation of esters, they are sweet smelling compounds. We say pleasant or fruity smelling compounds. We go on, my student, you can see that one, process S. Ethanol becoming ethanoic acid. Automatically, there is one O there, there are two. Oxidation. That is it. We have done an oxidation process. Then the condition necessary for that Yes, we need an oxidizing agent, be it acidified potassium manganate 7 or acidified potassium dichromate 6. The chemical reaction, as you can see, the O, it's the O for the, uh, uh, whatever, the alkanoic acid there, you can see. 
good. We continue. We continue. Yes. All okay. Maybe before we continue, these are very important points there. The observation. Uh, the acidified potassium manganate seven changes from purple to colorless. The dichromate changes from orange to green when this process takes place. Sometimes warming is necessary with the dichromate. Process T, you're starting with uh, ethanoic acid, going to sodium ethanoid, CO2 and water. Automatically, anytime CO2 comes out, most likely carbonate is there. So that's a general reaction between an acid and a carbonate, or hydrogen carbonate for that matter. So like for this one, we're using sodium carbonate or sodium uh, hydrogen carbonate. And the CO2, that is a salt, CO2 and water are produced. So that is it. Uh, the reaction, my student, as it is, study the mechanism as much as I've tried to show you there. And this process can be used to distinguish between alkanoes and alkanoic acid because alkanoic acid react with carbonate to give you uh, effervescence of a colorless gas, but alkanoes do not. So you have said alkanoic acid react with carbonates, effervescence of a colorless gas. Alkanos do not. So there will be no effervescence in case the substance you are analyzing is an alkano. We move on to process U. We are talking about uh, an alkanoic acid here, ethanol, uh, methanol that is, yeah, ethanol, ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid, and you get sodium methanoid and hydrogen gas. That's a general reaction of an acid and a metal. You get uh, salt and hydrogen gas, you can see the metal that you're using is sodium. Yes, you're using sodium metal. The reaction, as you can see it there, as you can see that reaction. We move on to process U, starting from ethanoic acid to sodium ethanoate and water, that is salt and water, a neutralization reaction. The reaction between a base and an acid. What base do you need there? Sodium hydroxide. Yes, sodium hydroxide, of course, you can see there, you can see there, it is uh, an acid and a base, you get salt, sodium ethanoid, and water. Study the mechanism, my student, there. We move on, process W, process W. Long chain alkanes, then you end up with a shorter alkane. This one is just but the general sources of alkanes, the sources of alkanes. And uh, if that is the case, uh, this process is called cracking, cracking of alkanes. Either you're using temperature, thermal cracking, or you're using a catalyst. You're using a catalyst, zeolite, aluminum oxide, silicon, oxide, etc., etc., for cracking. Good, we have the general process there. The long chain alkane can be broken down to shorter alkanes, uh, shorter alkenes, and hydrogen gas. So, though sometimes it's not a must for hydrogen gas to be produced, but generally it is one of the product there. You can see, for instance, I'm cracking propane. I end up with methane, a shorter alkane, propene, and ethene, and even hydrogen gas. More products forming there. So, my student, maybe a question can be asked what is the use of this cracking? It leads to formation of shorter alkenes, alkanes with A alkanes, yes, that are more useful. Yes, the shorter alkanes are more useful than the longer one. Good. Um, the cracking process is used to generate hydrogen used in harbor process. That's nice, my student. We move on. Process X. You have sodium ethanoid, then you end up with ethane. Uh, that is, yeah, ethane. That process, that's a general reaction for the preparation of ethane. You need a sodium or a metal uh, alkanoid, uh, al alkanoid, then you react it with what we call uh, soda lime. And specifically in soda lime, we are interested with sodium hydroxide because soda lime is a mixture of sodium hydroxide and calcium oxide. Yes, and of course, heating is necessary here. And maybe we are going to explain why we need sodium hydroxide mixed with calcium oxide. Like with this one, we need ethane. 
if we need ethane, we use uh, sodium propanoid. In case we need methane, we are going to use sodium ethanoid. In case we need propane, we are going to use the, we need a propane, we are going to use sodium butanoid, etc, etc. And of course you can see the products, carbonate is produced there. As you can see there, the sodium carbonate, this should be a two there. Sodium carbonate. Good. We move on. That is, uh, okay, why use soda lime? Yes, instead of pure sodium hydroxide. The answer for that, sodium hydroxide is highly hygroscopic. Actually, it's deliquescent. So, just to ensure that it does not absorb water and become a liquid, you use calcium oxide that will absorb moisture uh, preferentially, or it will absorb moisture in state there. So, that's the reason why we use soda lime and not sodium hydroxide. Yes, process why crude oil uh, becoming uh, an alkane. That is fractional distillation of crude oil. Fractional distillation, we need some heat. The process, as you can see, the petroleum or crude oil can be taken through a fractional distillation. You then get the variety of petroleum products. Then, like you can see that, this is maybe an illustration of what exactly happens. The crude oil, you burn it, then it gets into the fractionating tower. The component of crude oil with less boiling points will be the one distilling out first, all the way down to the highest uh, boiling point there. So the gases, the gasoline, the naphtha, kerosene, diesel, uh, fuel oil, lubricating oil, residue, be it bitumen, tar, etc. So that is just an illustration of what exactly happens. For example, in Changamwe, Kenya, where we do the refinery of oil. Okay, okay, those are just but uh, some products of petroleum. That is petroleum product, those with the short carbon uh, chain, you can see those are gases, and of course the uses. Those with the longer one, 4 to 12, you can see the petroleum, the petrol is there, gasoline, etc. And the uses. So my student just post the video and study that table. Study the table. Maybe other common processes that I did not cover in detail, saponification, the hydrolysis of fat to form a uh, soap, uh, that is uh, the, the salt there, uh, and of course glycerol is formed. So the general reaction, my student, there it is. Fats are hydrolyzed by an alkali to form soap and glycerol. Good, you can look at that one. The fatty acids, those are examples of esters. You take them through a hydrolysis process with an alkali. Yes, it has uh, 18 carbon. So it has 18 carbon, that is with 8, it is octa. Then 10 is deca, so octa decanoid. So that is an octa decanoid, sodium octa decanoid. Other is called sodium stearate, the structure of soap. And of course, glycerol. That is saponification, the process for the manufacture of soapy detergents. Other processes, vulcanization, hardening of rubber. Like the natural rubber that is tapped from the rubber tree, it is made up of isoprene. Uh, isoprene is basically 2-methyl uh, but one to die in. That one, you can see that one. That's a 2-methyl. Yes, 2-methyl uh, one to uh, but one to die in. That, that is the monomer for the rubber. If that is a process, you can see how rubber is formed, the polymer itself. So this natural rubber is very soft. And the way to harden it is to react it. You burn it, yes, with sulfur, heating it with sulfur. And that process is called uh, vulcanization or vulcanization. And why do we do that? We make sure that that rubber is tough, less flexible, and of course less soft. Uh, the hardened rubber, it will look like that. So between the chain, the, the, the polymer, there will be links of sulfur. And that is vulcanization, a process that maybe it's not very much covered, but my students know, with the changing trends in marking and setting, you should be very keen with uh, some of the concepts. 
Okay, the preparation of ethyne. Yes, the preparation of ethyne. This one I did not talk much about it, but calcium carbide reacting with water forms ethyne. That is it. So, my student, thank you so much for watching. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, wishing you a prosperous 2023 as we continue conquering in this field of chemistry. Thank you so much. Do not forget to support this work by subscribing. Do leave your comment, like it, share. Uh, re uh, recommend to a student or somebody you know is in high school. And uh, I will continue to appreciate. This is Dr. Sami.